Good evening and welcome everyone to the University of Adelaide's Make History Speaker Series, Making Cancer History. My name is Professor Karina Vandenhuvel. I'm the head of the School of Biomedicine and it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to our beautiful campus and the Braggs Lecture Theatre this evening to hear from our esteemed panel. Um, firstly, I would like to start today's speaker series by acknowledging that we meet on the lands of the Ghana people, the traditional owners of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which our beautiful University of Adelaide campuses are built, and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. Always was, always will be Ghana land. Before we hear from our first speaker, I'd like to quickly run through the format of tonight's session. Um, so we are going to start by giving each of the three panellists the chance to come up and give an overview of their career, um, journey and research. And then, then we will bring all the panellists together on these fabulous lounges over here and to begin our discussion. Um, and finally, we will open the floor and most importantly, from questions from you to our panelists. So I would now like to invite <laughs> my colleague, um, Professor Andrew Zanatino, Executive Dean of the Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences, uh, to say a few words and introduce our panel for this evening. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Karina. Um, it's <laughs> okay. uh, it's <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's great to see that somebody's taken my lounge suite from the 1970s and brought it here this evening. It's lovely. Um, look, thank you so much, Corinna. And um, before I introduce our guest speakers this evening, I also would like to pay respects to the fact that we meet on the land of the Ghana people and I'd like to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. Mani Nadlu, Tampinti, Nadlu, Ghana Yatanga in Pereti. It's my absolute pleasure to be here this evening. It is, in fact, I think I've got the world's best job in the world um, in that I actually get the honour and privilege of, of doing things like this, and that is to actually welcome back some incredible people who have made a massive impact uh, on an international stage. Uh, in particular, um, Professor Charles Mulligan, um, Professor Chris Sweeney, and Professor Jane Visvader. Um, what you may not know is that they are all alumni of this fine institution, the University of Adelaide. And um, we're very privileged that they've made their way back um, to Adelaide this evening to give a presentation and to be open to questions from the audience. So I would ask that you keep your thinking caps on, I think they used to say at school, um, and to come up with some really curler questions for them, because I'm sure they'll be able to answer them. But. Um, I'm going to start by introducing the first of our three speakers, and that's Professor Charles Mulligan. Um, as I in indicated, he's a graduate from Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery in 1992 here at the University's Adelaide Medical School. Um, he's an academic haematologist um, who has devoted his career uh, in defining the genetic basis of acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. And this is a leading cause of childhood cancer. Um, his work has resulted in multiple seminal studies that have tr really transformed our understanding of this disease and related tumours. Uh, he has led studies which have identified a number of key genetic markers that can exist in the diagnosis and prediction and prognosis of that disease. But probably most uh, importantly, he's identified those targets which are actionable and actually can be targeted uh, in patients with high-risk leukaemia. Uh, Charles joined the Department of Pathology at St Jude's Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee in 2008 and currently serves as the Deputy Director and Co-Leader of the Haematological Malignancies Program of St Jude Comprehensive Cancer Centre. He also holds the William E Evans Endowed Chair and is also the Medical Director of the St Jude's Biorepository. Charles has received numerous honours including the NCIR 35 Outstanding Investigator Award in 2017 the American Society of Haematology William Damaschek Prize and the Mayenberg Prize for Cancer Research and in 2016 the inaugural St Baldrick's Foundation Robert J. Arecci Innovation Award. And I've probably said that wrongly, but you can correct me later. Our second speaker this evening, also a graduate of this fine university, and that is Professor Jane Visvader. Uh, Professor Visvader is a leading Australian molecular and cellular biologist whose cancer research focuses on the role of stem cell biology 
in breast development and in breast cancer. Following a PhD studies here at the University of Adelaide, Jane held postdoctoral positions at the Salk Institute San Diego and the Children's Hospital Harvard Medical School in Boston. In 1998, she was appointed as laboratory head at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne, uh, where she leads studies on breast development and breast cancer. Jane is now a joint head of the Breast Cancer Laboratory and the Division of Cancer Biology and Stem Cells at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. And she holds professorial appointment with the University of Melbourne. In a remarkable discovery, her team was one of the first to discover and isolate breast stem cells. This work and her subsequent identification of the master regulators of mammary gland development and cells of origin of cancer has really altered our understanding of breast cancer uh, and really pioneered a new area of research, largely known largely as breast stem cell biology. Collectively, these findings have laid the framework for translating basic discoveries to the clinic, aiming for improved breast cancer outcomes for the next generation of women. Our final speaker this evening is Professor Christopher Sweeney, or Chris, to those who know him. Chris is a medical oncologist whose appointment as South Australian Immunogenomics Cancer Institute, or Sugensi's inaugural, inaugural director in 2021, was a really a coup for South Australia to bring back Chris after more than two and a half decades uh, in, in Boston was a real achievement for us here at the University of Adelaide and our colleagues at Central Adelaide Local Health Network who worked together to recruit Chris back to um, start up what we hope will be a world leading cancer institute over time. So following the completion of his medical degree here at the University of Adelaide and an internship at the Royal Adelaide Hospital Chris left our shores and travelled to the US, where he completed his residency in international medicine at Gunderson Lutheran Medical Centre, La Crosse, Wisconsin. This was followed by a fellowship in haematology oncology at Indiana University Medical Centre, where he was later appointed Associate Director for Clinical Research at the Simon Cancer Centre. He subsequently joined the Lank Centre for Genitourinary Oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School. Uh, as the Professor of Medicine in 2009, where he pursued research and interest in drug discovery and development and the management of genitourinary malignancies with a focus on prostate and testicular cancer. Chris has developed a compelling scientific vision and mission for Sugensi, and along with the team, he has embarked upon the recruitment of some absolutely outstanding research talent to South Australia, for which I'm extremely proud. We are very fortunate to have him back home, uh, back to South Australia where he belongs, and to provide his wealth of experience and skills that he's accumulated overseas. Look, unfortunately, that's all we have time for uh, this evening, given that I've taken all that time to give an introduction to our three speakers. But as you can appreciate, um, they are renowned internationally, they are homegrown, and they are people we are enormously proud of, and we're so delighted to bring them to you this evening. So, welcome. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so as mentioned earlier, um, what I will first be doing uh, for this evening's discussion, I'm going to invite each of the um, panellists up to give an overview of their career journey and their area of cancer research. So um, I'd firstly like to welcome to the stage Professor Charles Mulligan. Thank you very much, Corinna, and to Andrew for the kind introduction, and good evening, everyone. It's a real honour to be here and participate in this great forum. Um, so as Andrew mentioned, my uh, research career um, has really now spanned over uh, almost 30 years. I've had connections with the university for over three decades now, which is somewhat sobering. And um, I guess my road has been as long and as winding as many. And one thing I've learned over those years is that you have to let life change you and grasp opportunities as much as you try and create those directions for yourself. So we were asked to give you know, a fairly brief set of comments about our path to date and some initial remarks about what we feel as research priorities in our area. And that's what I'll try and do um, in the next few minutes. So I was born and raised in Adelaide. Both of my parents were from South Australia. Um, I, as, as Andrew mentioned, I trained at the University of Adelaide and did my internship here. 
Um, there's a younger and somewhat more callow me in the middle of that slide soon after graduating. Um, and then again, the connections with the university have come throughout my life. Um, I was fortunate to get a university scholarship as well as an, a, a, an Australian Anachin MRC scholarship to study overseas. And rather than as many people do after internship embarking on specialist training, I was a bit undecided and I knew I wanted to pursue some fundamental research. And so I pursued that in um, understanding how our genes control and regulate the immune response and did that in the University of Oxford. Another connection with the University of Adelaide, quite unexpectedly and by chance, I found myself living just a couple of doors down from where Howard Florey, um, Lord Florey, uh, Baron Florey of Marston and Adelaide, who developed penicillin, of course, around World War II, um, lived during that time and was able to speak with members of his team. It was really a very uh, privileged experience. So I then came back and did basic physician's training, which is kind of the entry point to training as a medical specialist and still didn't really know what I wanted to do. And really the light bulb moment for me was when I started working on the haematology ward. And I really admired those clinicians that split their time between looking after critically ill patients, but they're also deeply invested in the science. They're often doing the diagnostic procedures themselves. Um, and this really sparked my interest. And so I completed training and, and really was not quite sure where I would go next. Um, and right at the end of my training, I was at our, um, the, the, the worldwide annual meeting of hematology, the American Society meeting, back in the early 2000s. And this technology called microarray profiling was just becoming used. And this is using chips about a quarter of an inch in size that could give a snapshot of expression of genes right across the genome. And it was showing that it could really give some profound insights into many different tumors, including acute leukemia. I looked around and I was discussing this with um, one of the oncologists at the Royal Adelaide at the time, Michael Brown, who just finished his training at St. Jude and was coming back to Adelaide, and, or he'd come back to Adelaide, and he said, you should think about going to St. Jude, you want for nothing, and that stuck with me and that ended up being where I went. And so there's my postdoctoral lab, um, Jim Downing in the middle there, who's now CEO of the institution that I did my training with. So then another, juncture about what I would do. And again, life tr changes you. And I borrow this quote from Rockefeller about the secrets of success, where he said, you've got to get up early, you've got to work late, and you've got to strike oil, meaning for him, you need a little bit of luck. And I think that's also proven true during my career. And for me, was the striking oil moment was when we'd taken another type of microarray, this time looking at DNA rather than RNA. And after some effort, we could show that it could in quite a precise way, show us very small changes in genes that have previously been beyond the limits of resolution of any other technique. And the details here are not important, but this uh, stimulated what really became a revolution in our understanding of the commonest childhood tumor, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And then over time, we extended these studies using microarrays and then next generation sequencing. We sequenced the first childhood cancer genome, at the time, there were very few of them. It was a lot of work. And we've just wrapped up two studies where, in contrast to the first ones where we sequenced just 10 or 12, we're now sequencing 1,000 or 1,500 cases at full genomic resolution uh, in current studies. And this journey continues, but it's now starting to, to pivot and change, as I'll mention to you in a moment. So then the decision was what to do. And it, it was very tempting to come home, but I really thought, what do I want to do with research? And things are really starting to take off. And I thought there's really no better place to do what I want to do, which is to stay at St. Jude. And they offered me a job and that's where I've been to this day. This is the founder of St. Jude on the left, Danny Thomas. Um, and of course you might recognize the person on the right. Um, and since that time, I've kind of progressed through the ranks and I'm now you know, a full professor or full member, um, as they call them in a, a non-university setting in the US and run several of our infrastructures, which has also been um, an exciting opportunity for, um, for developing some leadership and vision for scientific direction. So why stay there? And I, I couch it into these three principles, and that is it is an exceptionally mission-focused institution. So in contrast to many academic institutions that may be much larger, much more diverse in their focus, that the mission of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital is that no child should, do, should die in the dawn of life. That the mission is to find cures and save children. And everything we do and every dollar that's spent of donors' contributions is directed towards that one mission. Because of that, um, resource is exceptionally important. It is a well-funded institution, 
And the benefit of that is that if people have good ideas and bring them forward, they're, they're scientifically vetted in a rigorous way, but they're funded. And I'll mention a couple of these in a moment. And it has tremendous scientific uh, concentration and collaboration. We have scientists, not just clinicians or cancer researchers like me, but basic scientists that bring their various perspectives from all areas of research to focus on this goal. So a little bit about the research. So, so childhood cancer may not be on many people's radar. It would be, of course, if you've been touched by it in your family, but it is the leading, common, the leading cause of death from disease in the young. There are three main groups of childhood cancer, blood tumors like leukemia, brain tumors, and solid tumors. And in contrast to many adult tumors, they're really considered diseases of development, development gone awry. They're often mutationally very quiet or sparse with few genetic changes, but they're crucially important. And the paradox of acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is the commonest one, is that we now cure over 90% of children, but because it's the commonest tumor, when it comes back, and it's very difficult to cure once it comes back, um, most children die of the disease. And most of our treatments, as you can see here, were developed many decades ago, and that remains true to, to this day. And so therapeutically, most of our trials have really reached a maximum or an asymptote, if you like, of intensity where we can't just keep increasing the intensity of treatment. Um, it's not tolerated. And indeed, one of the goals of, of curing more children with leukemia safely is actually to identify which children not just need better treatments, but which ones can be cured with less treatment so we can give children the best symptom-free future in their post-leukemia life. So what does my program do? So I group it, group it into these three areas. Um, we do a lot of genomic profiling and we've benefited from studying many thousands of samples right across the age spectrum. But that's not all we do. We then take these discoveries into, into the lab and gain understanding by building experimental models around them to understand how these changes drive leukemia, how they influence treatment response and how they might be targeted. And we have a very active program in developing new therapeutic approaches, particularly for targets that pharma neglect or using technologies that um, are not so widely used at the moment. I, can't, I don't have time and it's not really the purpose to go into this in detail, but that first image which is now blown up here is showing you how we've taken what was a very poorly understood disease and exploded it now into many different subtypes, each with its own constellations of genomic changes. We've shown that these genetic changes, again, the detail here is not so important, but these different sets of genetic changes vary widely in frequency according to age. And this was a major discovery from our work is that it, it explains in large part why as children and adults increase in their age when leukemia develops, why they do worse um, in, in older life. We've shown that many of these genetic changes that we've discovered influence the risk of treatment response. These are survival rates both in children at the top and adults down below. And on this slide, it shows that many of these new genetic changes and the subtypes that they're associated with are druggable. And it's not always matching a mutation to a drug. That's probably the minority of how we think we can advance the disease. But there are often some unexpected back doors that we and others have found where we've identified Achilles heels, where we can now start to take existing treatments or new treatments and match them to patients according to their genetic changes. The challenge, of course, is a numbers game because each of these subtypes is a rare disease and um, that speaks to the need of doing this collaboratively around the world. So my last slide is, is just briefly giving you three examples of where I think um, we need to work actively. These are not all areas, um, they're my bias they're not ranked, but I think they're important. So one I've touched on is, and that is moving beyond the genomic era. So pediatric cancer is genetically relatively quiet. Relatively few of the genetic changes we see have an available drug on the shelf that we can match to that mutation. And so there is a great need to identify these unknown vulnerabilities or Achilles heels that we can then go after and develop new uh, drug treatment approaches. There is a project that was run out of the Broad um, in Boston called the Dependency Map. And so we've embarked on a $50 million collaboration between the Broad, Dana-Farber and St. Jude to um, expand this project into the Pediatric Dependency Map Accelerator, which is a very exciting project using genome editing technology to find these new targets. The second approach I've touched on already, and that is 
going where pharma won't or are reluctant to go, and that is drugging the undruggable. We know a lot about these drivers that stimulate the growth of childhood cancer, but there's a great reluctance to pursue them because they're hard and they're often considered to be undruggable. But there is a new suite or multiple types of uh, chemical biology approach that could potentially treat these difficult targets very efficaciously. And this is a, a great area of activity that I'd be delighted to, to talk about more called protein degradation. And the second one is really coming back to St. Jude's global mission, and that is to cure all children globally. And um, you know, we, we treat patients that come to our institution, we treat patients around North America, and indeed now we partner with sites in Australia, but 90% of children with cancer around the world are not adequately treated. And in fact, a lot of the difficulty there is not things like drug delivery or quality care when they're being treated, but it's just initial diagnosis. And so this project that I show on the bottom is a very exciting new project that we are involved in at St. Jude, which is to deploy this new era of genomics and to take it into low and middle income countries where they might even not even have conventional pathology and leapfrog that to, to offer the best contemporary genomic diagnosis and to then enable children to be treated in the best possible way. So there I'll stop. There's our campus on the banks of the Mississippi and um, I'll hand over to Jane, I guess. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. I'm sure many of you will have questions for Charles later, so we'll open that to the floor in a little while. But it's my pleasure now to invite Professor Jane Visveda to the podium. Thank you very much, Karina. And I'm very honoured to be uh, invited to be part of this very special event. So thank you. This is a hard act to follow, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me see. So I too am born and bred in Adelaide. All of my training uh, was carried out at the um, University of Adelaide, Bachelor of Science, Honours, and a PhD in the Department of Biochemistry. So why biochemistry? It was this department, and I did my PhD in the mid 80s, was um, for decades a powerhouse of molecular biology research and, and consequent nature papers. It was a veritable powerhouse. And I was fortunate um, to, to do my PhD with Bob Simons. Um, he was a plant virologist. Uh, he actually was re is responsible for seeding many um, scientists around Australia. And of course, he was an exceptional molecular biologist um, that introduced breakthrough technologies such as DNA cloning from around the world into, um, into the University of Adelaide and he actually made a lot of the isotopes and all of the molecular reagents for the entire nation. So it, it was a phenomenal time to be in this department. And I'm also very proud to have been his first female PhD student. And I got to work on some very exotic um, RNA-based um, <laughs> plant viroids with names like coconut kadangkadang viroid, citrus exocortis viroid, and avocado sunblotch viroid. So there you go. So after that, um, I turned to my real passion, which was cancer research. And um, I had three stints or positions, all devoted to looking at transcription factors actually in the blood, either normal blood development or leukemia. And they were at the Salk Institute in San Diego. Then I came back um, to Australia, but to the Walter and Liza Hall Institute because they were doing a lot of cancer research at that time. Um, I then went on to um, the Children's Hospital in Boston, actually with my, my husband. I had not intended to return to the US um, right at that point, but I am um, very glad that I did. It was, uh, I had a, a very productive um, and fantastic time um, as, a, as an instructor or research associate there. So um, towards the end of 1997, uh, institute directors in Melbourne, phoned up with a, a new proposition, would I be interested in uh, switching gears from blood leukaemia to, to breast cancer and to be part of a new initiative that was set up by the state government. This was um, a unique opportunity, uh, not only to try and put breast cancer on the map for Victoria, because virtually nothing was done there, very little in Australia in fact, um, apart from the Garvin Institute where Rob Sutherland was. So it was a unique opportunity. It was 10 years of funding provided 
you were productive. 10 years of funding, which is absolutely unheard of in the Australian environment. So I said yes, and Jeff Lindemann, uh, my close collaborator, also said yes, and we've tended to run our labs very closely over the last 25 years. Um, so next, what about, uh, so a bit on the research. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to say at this point that I, um, yeah, reflecting on the last 25 years, I really have had the privilege of working with an amazing team of people and also with Jeff Lindemann, who was a clinician scientist and allowed us to take our basic findings to the clinic. So without this, you know, it would not have been possible. So breast cancer needs very little introduction, and I think we'll go through this in the question time, but it, you know, there's a one in seven lifetime risk uh, for women in Australia. In 2020, more than 685,000 women died um, of cancer, which is staggering, and this is increasing. It's very diverse. It's not just one disease. It's a collection of diseases. There are 18 to 20 histological subtypes. There are five dominant molecular subtypes. And my, when I came in to, um, came back to Melbourne to be part of this breast cancer venture, my objective was to try and understand the normal cell types that live in breast tissue, to understand how they contribute to normal development, and then to use this um, as a framework to understand molecular and cellular changes that give rise to breast cancer. And so after years of work um, in the lab, we, we did strike gold or oil. We managed to identify the, um, the stem cell, which sits um, at the very, th this stem cell is the seed which gives rise to all cells within the breast ductal tree. And we subsequently identified progenitors or daughter cells, and these are the cells that then give rise to the mature cells that form the ductal tree. And th this has uh, formed a very important framework for understanding breast cancer because we could correlate um, the properties of these cells with the different subtypes of breast cancer. I'm, I'm not going to go into the details now, but it was a really important step to understand that different, the different subtypes of breast cancer likely arise from different normal cells in breast tissue. So moving on from there, we then were able to identify the cell that goes awry in precancerous tissue from BRCA1 mutation carriers. So women that carry a faulty BRCA1 gene um, have a 70% 70, 70 risk of uh, developing breast cancer, a 40% risk of ovarian cancer. And so um, the options for these individuals are very limited, um, a radical mastectomy, an ovarectomy, often in their 20s. So we embarked on trying to identify the earliest cellular changes. And in fact, it occurs in the luminal progenitor or daughter cell, not in the stem cell as previously thought. And so this was really a paradigm shift. We then went on to identify rank, which um, lives on the, it's expressed on the surface of these cells. And this meant that we could, uh, well, it provided a potential strategy in order to target these cells. And in fact, um, we are using a pre-existing drug, denosumab, which is used for osteoporosis uh, in a phase three clinical trial. And the idea behind this trial is the inhibitor uh, stops signaling to this rank molecule on the surface of these daughter cells. It switches the growth of these cells off and hopefully will buy time for BRCA1 mutation carriers, either preventing or at least delaying the development of tumors. And so we've also been, um, I just, just in a snapshot, we've been using a number of technologies to probe, uh, to further probe um, molecular and cellular mechanisms that contribute to, to breast cancer with the aim of identifying improved biomarkers and novel therapies. So the last slide was about prevention therapy. This is more about uh, new therapies. So uh, just in this snapshot, uh, you can see um, that we, we're able to track cells by three-dimensional imaging. And we can track these cells as they go on to form a tumor or in the case of a bone metastasis. And so this is to, to, to identify better markers. Also, um, as Charles is doing um, for, for uh, childhood cancers, 
we're trying to understand the cellular diversity by, um, by doing very sophisticated cell analysis on uh, as many breast cancers as we can to understand interactions between the cancer cells and their surrounding environment because these, these relationships are bilateral and they, uh, they are very important in dictating um, cancer progress. And we're also, we've developed over many years more than 100 preclinical models and um, one of these, well, actually, two of them have been taken to the clinic, um, and the, the, they really centre on venetoclux, which um, targets a survival molecule that is pivotal for tumour cells. So I think I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. And now it's over to my colleague, Professor Chris Sweeney. Thanks, uh, Charles and Jane, that's amazing. I'm gonna try and do something different by focusing on clinical trial data. Um, but what I'd just say is these are specimens from a prostate cancer spe uh, cohort of patients that I had at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Institute. So this is research in action. And what does it mean? These are proteins in cancer cells. You can see different colors mean different proteins. And this is the type of thing we actually see in our patients but how do we actually make use of this information? How do we actually translate this into treating patients better? We've got a lot of work to do. And I'll just give you some examples of how we've been doing it from a clinical trial perspective. Jane and Charles have done a kind of wonderful job of showing how it happens at the basic science level, but let's look at clinical trials. So first of all, this is the migration pattern of a curious medical oncologist. I started in, I was born in Darwin in 1969. Uh, mum and dad were seconded from being teachers here and they were teaching up at Darwin High and mum was having uh, five kids, or raising five kids. At, from the age of six months to 23 years, I came back to Adelaide and I graduated with Charles in uh, 1992. And actually also with Corinna, we all were at the same graduation ceremony, it turns out, in 1993. Um, I got curious and went to the United States and as Andrew nicely articulated, I started out in the mid Midwest and then moved over to Boston um, and worked my way through the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and which was part of the Harvard Medical School. It was an amazing experience. I learned a lot. And then I said, it's time to get back home. And I had the great opportunity and landed back in December 2022. Sometimes, what was it Jody Mitchell? You don't know what you've got until what you've got is gone. So I came back to Adelaide and realised it's an amazing city. And so much has happened in the last 10 years. The Biomed Precinct, the university, and all the investment that has gone into biomedical research and, and education. It's an incredible city and I'm so lucky to be back in an incredible state. Um, but I'm gonna focus on prostate cancer. Uh, with all, I think a lot of people hear about prostate cancer and if you're confused about it, understandable. The mixed messages are incredibly un, uh, confusing. In, the United, in Australia, about 24,000 men are diagnosed per year um, and most men are cured with it. Some men don't even need the surgery or the prostatec uh, or radiation. They die of something else, even if the cancer just sits there. And we hear a lot about that. But then we hear about men who die from prostate cancer. And we go, well, what's the, what's the disconnect there? And we'll come into that later. So what we have learned, and this is where I've been doing a lot of clinical trials, is men who have disease that you can see on a CAT scan or a bone scan, and we take away the testosterone, the cancer shrinks for a little bit, and then it comes back. And we've been doing most of our treatments in the castration-resistant later stage disease. And about 3,500 men die from prostate cancer in the United States, in Australia every year. I'm in the Australia, in Australia. Um, <laughs> uh, and, but it's about 30% of all male cancer deaths. And I asked myself, what can I do to decrease the number of men dying from prostate cancer? I did do that. It was a bit grandiose, wasn't it? So I took my lithium. And um, I basically said, well, we have these disease, drugs that work in resistant disease. Maybe it'll work more effectively if we uh, go forwards by going backwards and do the therapies in castration resistant disease in hormone-sensitive setting. 
And this was a drug that was generic, so there was little pharmaceutical industry uh, interest because it was going off the patent lifespan. And the National Cancer Institute, which supports work where I was at at Indiana University at the time, and puts teams together, clinical trial groups. This one was called ECOG Akron. Charles is a part of the Ch Children's Oncology Group, which are all funded by the NCI taxpayer money. And they said, well, that's not that crazy. We'll sponsor the trial. And this is the study, charted. It's not a Dutch study, the AA. It's actually an acronym. Chemo Hormonal Antiandrogen uh, Randomized Trial on Extensive Disease. And it was basically men with metastatic disease, put them on hormones with or without the chemotherapy docetaxel. And chemotherapy is a little bit like throwing a monkey wrench. It's a monkey wrench here, or spanner in the study. Spanner into the machinery, and it <coughs> stops the cells from turning over, and the cancer cells die. So attacking cancer cells. One, take away the fuel, and another one, throw the monkey wrench, the spanner, into the works, and it stops. So, oh, that was a bit too excited. So this actually resulted in a presentation at ASCO in 2014, and a publication in the New England Journal in 2015. This was the first time we've shown a way for men to live longer by taking chemotherapy with the hormones for the first time in 70 years. So 1940, we found about 100 androgens, driving cancer, taking away the androgens, the male hormones, responses. 70 years later, this is the first time we've shown a patients died, uh, less men were dying of prostate cancer or living, and living longer over time if we gave the chemotherapy up front. However, we did see that this didn't work in the slower growth cancer. It was only in the cancers with their very active cancer machinery. And that was a big day out. I gave a lecture to 12,000 people. Had a teleprompter, a little bit nervous, but it was a very exciting time. And, but then again, I, and before that study read out, um, we'd also developed this other therapy, a hormone approach, namely taking away the hormone fuel as well as the testosterone, but also blocking the receptor that takes on the testosterone and doing those two things together worked when you added in the castration resistant. Well, I said, well, hadn't read, the charter study hadn't read out the one with docetaxel and the, the team came to me and said, look, from well, I said that what came to the company and said, you know your new drug, uh, enzalutamide? They said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can we do a study in hormone-sensitive studies? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I find my office first? A couple of weeks later, he came back to me and said, found my office, because he was new to the company. And he said, uh, yeah, we'd love you to do the study. But um, I said, great. But you have to run it as an investigator-sponsored study, meaning you have to run it with all your teams. We, the pharmaceutical company, would give you money and the drug to do it. But you have complete control. And I said, yep, I'll do it through the American city. He said, no. No, I can't do it in America for a number of reasons. None of them good. And I said, I can't pull out my Australian passport and said, I'll take it to the Australians. And I, at this time in 2013, moved back and started working with Cancer Australia Group called Australia, ANZA, Australian New Zealand Urogenital Prostate Cancer Group, because this was the one group that could bring together to do this study in Canada, United States, uh, UK and Ireland. So, we were able to pull together a global study to do this with the help of the University of Sydney. So Australia is actually more facilitative because of its scrappy nature that it can bring people together to do another study. And we did this, and we went forwards again by going backwards, but this time without chemotherapy. And so here, similar study, double hormones versus one hormone, and we have this study again in the New England Journal and another presentation in front of 12,000 people. I got used to it, but by this time I was less nervous just a bit. And uh, green above the blue means more people are living longer. And even in some of the patients with the more aggressive cancers, 50% of the patients are starting to die of something else other than prostate cancer because they're living with and dying from something, living with prostate cancer on therapy and dying of something else. So we're starting to make progress where we're hoping to decrease the death rate from prostate cancer. And a, and a whim of a thought in 2003, when I wrote the chemotherapy study, we started to get there somewhere in 2023. Moving over. That's it for now. Thank you so much, Chris. I'd just like now to invite the panel up to join me on the couches for some more questions. Chris, I'll start with you. 
if that's okay. Can you please give us your thoughts on using prostate specific antigen testing to identify cancer early? So that's part one of the question because I believe you have some slides that might be helpful in answering that. Uh, a little bit. I'll just, uh, audience participation, who's heard of PSA testing? Who's confused as to whether it helps or not? Exactly. So I'm got, these are conversation starters and I'd love to get Charles and, and Jane's opinions on some of these topics as it relates to breast cancer and childhood cancers. So we're covering the whole cancer spectrum. It's not just a male issue, but the whole cancer spectrum. So we hear about uh, prostate cancer, PSA testing. Some say we should do it and they're almost militant about it and others saying, oh no, we don't want to do that. And I just say it's a problem of perspective where you're at. So it, from a public policy perspective, from the purse drinks, there are people who say, well, we don't want to do that because we're going to find too many cancers and we're going to cause too many side effects. Many, many men die with prostate cancer and we didn't need, need to know about it. And it puts a strain on the budget. That's one perspective. And then the man with prostate cancer say, I wish I didn't have it. Could I have been diagnosed earlier? How do I avoid the side effects and dying from it? I mean, that's a very real perspective, but it's a minority voice when you're thinking about it's not all men, the other 87% of men who don't get cancer. Men without prostate cancer, what can I do to protect myself? We've got PCFA and the September fundraising going on right now. Am I at risk of getting it? And so the medical community, you've got one perspective with the GPs and the radiation oncologists, urologists and oncologists all having a different perspective because they see different parts of the disease. The patients at different stages, the GPs, overwhelmed with trying to work out whether it, there is something to do to doing a PSA test and other people who have uh, no business getting a PSA test because they're 85 years of age and they've got heart disease and they're not going to be troubled by prostate cancer. And then there's the fit young rooster of like an Andrew Zanatino who's in his prime of his age and should he be getting it? And these are the questions that all come up. And then the scientists and the philanthropists want to help cure this. And how can I, what can I do to prevent this? So. This is where we're at in prostate cancer, but I think somewhat relates to breast cancer, mammography screening, and um, who should get it, what age, should we do ultrasounds or MRIs? I mean, it's complicated, and how do we identify kids at a, a young age before they've got a cancer that they may be getting at risk of getting a leukaemia? So, Charles and Jane, comments on a slide like this apply to childhood cancers and breast cancer? And how can we address this? You go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, for, for leukaemia in general, I mean, I would break it out by age. And, you know, the, there is a continuum of the disease biology. But if we look at the childhood end of the spectrum, then um, you know, one thing I didn't mention was we have an increasing understanding that a lot of it is uh, in part from a genetic predisposition. We think probably 10 to 15% of childhood leukemias have some level of genetic predisposition and often it's very strong. It runs in families. It's not that common, but it happens. And that's probably a, a gross underestimate as we get more and more of these large-scale genomic studies completed. Probably the proportion of childhood cancers that are heritable in part will rise. So it's no longer bad luck as you know parents used to be told, but there's, there's biology as to why children develop it. So is it preventable? So there is a lot of debate about this and it's a difficult question because I, at the moment it's most childhood cancer is probably not, childhood leukaemia is not preventable per se, but if you were to detect the early changes, what would you do about it? And there's not a good answer for that at the moment because really the, the course of action would be the intensive treatment you give to a child when they have fully fledged leukaemia. But that said, there is, the rationale for certain of these genetic changes that you would surveil children over time and look for changes and provide counselling to patients and their families that might influence uh, subsequent management. Later in the age spectrum, things differ. You know, I, I mentioned that some subtypes of leukaemia become more prevalent in older life and there are some of those that are very strongly genetically determined. So one of the commonest cancer genes that you may have heard of is a gene called P53 or TP53. And that's mutated in many different types of cancer and is often associated with familial cancer, 
but it's also very strongly associated with a very particular type of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And so that, that is another setting where um, identification of that genetic change or that subtype will prompt a particular course of action. In acute leukemia in older individuals, which is more acute myeloid leukemia than acute lymphoblastic leukemia, there's now a great deal of work, um, which is not a field I'm involved with, but it's very important, about this notion of what's called clonal hematopoiesis. And that is, as we get older, uh, stem cells, uh, normal stem cells become a little less normal and they start to pick up genetic changes and that can give them a bit of a fitness advantage and they'll start to expand over time. And that can lay the, the seed, if you like, for subsequent transition to acute leukemia. And so that is a situation where there is a great deal of clinical effort to develop risk scores, um, to inform patients about their risk of progression and how that should be managed and, and perhaps mitigated. So it's, sorry, it's a long answer. It's not an easy question to address and it's a, it's a field that's in a state of flux, but it is a very important one across the lifespan. So what I'm hearing is we need a lot more information. We need a lot more data. Quinn, do you have a follow-up question before I go to my next I slide? I sure do. I have a few uh, pre-planned questions that I'm going to throw to each of the panel members, but in the, in the instance of keeping as much time as possible for, for the audience to ask a que ask question, I'll just choose a few from the list. So, Chris, a follow-up question to you and your team. You've shown that the agents active in late stage um, resistant disease are more active in first-line therapy for metastatic or secondary disease. Can you please tell us about the work you have been leading that aims to prevent relapses after treatment for high-risk localised disease and decreases the risk of death, overall death from prostate cancer? For sure. And what I'll do is I'll just run through a few slides here. And it's sort of like a case study with prostate cancer, again, of what can be done. So this is the slide on the, the graph on the left just shows increase in prostate cancer when the PSA test came. And this was across the world. But on the right, you can see the number of men dying of prostate cancer is going down. So this speaks to early diagnosis it does possibly have an impact, but you've got to pair it with a, a countrywide or a nationwide approach. And what we saw here, interestingly enough, how things can change. So incidents went up and then the number of men presenting with metastatic disease, the lethal version, actually went down with time. But what happened is that the GPs were saying, we're, we're not sure if PSA testing helps. So we stopped doing it, and the number of men in the United States presenting with metastatic disease actually went up, that, where you can see that inflection going up. So we're taking the throttle off of PSA testing, but the challenge was, yes, we're diagnosing less men who didn't need it, but we were diagnosing less men who actually needed it to be pre presented. So there's, it's a, it is a public policy, it is a patient perspective, and it is a collaborative approach to actually understanding this. More people are getting PSA testing again now once we saw this, and so the challenge is if we can identify men before they develop metastatic disease, can we cure them? Um, and, the, and in Australia, what we see is that two-thirds of the men who die of prostate cancer are those who present with localised disease. And there was this study that was first presented in 1997. This is a long-term follow-up. The blue is men who got hormones with radiation rather than just radiation alone for their high-risk prostate cancer. So this contributed to less men dying of prostate cancer over 10 years because we gave intense therapy to men when it was localised that was treating the small metastases, the small spots we couldn't see, plus the radiation to the prostate versus than just radiating the prostate. So both in, and this is very similar to breast cancer. We know that when we diagnose cancers earlier and we intensify the therapy, we cure more people, but we actually have the challenge of over-treating some and under-treating some because we actually don't have the right treatments. People are still relapsing. So um, the, we'll stop there and not, ask Charles and Jane to think about, you see that and do you think that applies to childhood cancers? You alluded to it and what do you think we can do from a biology perspective to answer this for breast, prostate and childhood cancers? 
Is it, in terms of how, your, your question, Chris, is how do we advance cure rates or prevent relapse for childhood leukaemia? From ch yep. So it's interesting. I mean, it's you know obviously a lot of what I do is focused on the biology and the genetics, but it's been amazing in the last few years to see how having had no new options for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, we've now got lots. And so two of the new agents that came along were an antibody that targets B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is the commonest form, called blinatumumab, and then CAR T cell therapy. And, and those agents are now being implemented earlier in treatment. And so if I was to say, what's the approach to prevent relapse from ALL, the first bite of the cherry is the best. Cure it when it first comes. Don't kind of give standard therapy and hope it's going to be okay and then keep something in your back pocket for relapse. You know, pull out the howitzer when it's first treated. And that's what we're seeing. And in fact, when I started working in the field, we saw cure rates for children were pretty high and adults were pretty low. In fact, at some of the studies in adults where there was so much desperation, where they brought some of these agents in earlier that have shown that there are some forms of leukemia that are now treated without chemo at all. Um, with targeted therapy or very minimal treatment. And so these new approaches, there's, there's become more collaboration, not just around the world in our age groups, children or adults, but there's been more cross-pollination across the age spectrum between children and adults uh, to think about how do we have, you know, biologically informed unified trials that bring our best new agents earlier in treatment to cure the disease, to increase cure rates, to then de-intensify treatment for those that we now have a better feeling for can be curable with less intensive treatment. Current childhood cancer, acute lymphoblastic leukemia treatment is two and a half years with about nine drugs. It's very intensive. And so this is a very, very exciting time. But as mentioned, some of the challenges are that the pie has many slices now and we're often dealing even at an institution with ours, we might see each subtype once or twice a year. And so, we have to collaborate, otherwise we can't get enough numbers to get meaningful readouts implementing these new treatments. One other thing that none of us have touched on, I guess, I mean, you mentioned your slide, Chris, about samples, is that this notion of how important these are. Um, and um, you know, if you think about enrolments on clinical trials, then there's this dichotomy between adults and kids in that I think the, in the US, the figure is something like less than 5% of adults are enrolled on a clinical trial when they're diagnosed with cancer. With children, it's over, it depends on where, but it's over 50% in some places, it's over 90%. And so that comes with, you know, we have research in the title of our institution, and so parents kind of come in expecting that there will be quality research. And that involves not just testing whether new treatments are effective, but maximising everything, maximising use of the biological sample, perhaps engrafting them into mice so that we can test new therapies, collecting follow-up samples so we can track disease over time, use new molecular approaches. And, you know, again, all of these things are, you know, some will work and some might fizzle out. But this, this notion of making sure that all patients are enrolled on a well-thought-out clinical trial, as you've shown, Chris, with the best possible correlated biology is absolutely critical to advancing cures. So let's take it to Jane then. So Jane, you're a biologist. I'm going to have a leading question. Should a biologist just be sitting in a lab and just doing their own thing, or should they be interactive with the clinic and the clinicians and helping them design better clinical trials? It's a bit of a setup. Yeah, there's no doubt that. Well, I'd, I'd use bilateral. We have to go from the bench to bedside and back to the bench again. Otherwise, we cannot understand why cancers relapse, why they're drug resistant. I mean, it, it's absolutely pivotal to go in both, in both directions. And um, I mean, I'd only echo what's been said before. It, it's, it's a major challenge. So how do we prevent relapse? But once you have relapse, how do you effectively treat it? Because cancer cells are incredibly adept at turning on, you might shut down one pathway with drug X, but they're incredibly adept at switching on another pathway to overcome that, to then allow them to continue growing. So, I mean, I, I think the answer really lies in, it, oh, it comes back to this early treatment. I mean, early detection and um, using combina you know, effective combination therapy up front rather than waiting uh, for metastatic disease to, to set in. But it, th these are huge challenges and we have to, 
what we need to do is to, um, you know, have, for biologists to have access to clinical samples, to be looking at them in a very global sense, um, doing cell assays, doing genomics, understanding which pathways are going on or off, looking at all the new mutations or genetic errors that have been caused with time, and that will help us. In, that will help inform which treatments are going to be most effective at the early stage. Brilliant. So I think a lot of what we've heard about is data and data and more data, both basic science, lab dust and clinical trial data. So my next question relates to something that I'm sure many people in the audience would have heard about the word immunotherapy. Um, and immunotherapy is uses substances made by the body or a laboratory really to boost the um, immune systems and help the body find and destroy cancer cells. So this really is a question, I suppose, first for Jane, but also for Charles. So is immunotherapy being used at the moment against breast cancer, Jane? It is, um, but only for a very specific um, subset of patients with triple negative disease. So most breast cancers are ER positive and <clears throat> that the next um, most frequent would be those that express the antigen called, called HER2. And then there are also the triple negative um, cancers which are particularly aggressive. They actually have um, a huge infiltration of T-cells and these T-cells are kept in check by molecules that are expressed on tumour cells. So the tumour cells tell the immune cells to switch off, um, you know, don't, don't, don't kill me. They basically don't kill me signals. So immunotherapy is very effective because it inhibits this pathway and um, the T cells are then re-engaged and activated and they can then kill the tumour cells when used in combination it, uh, with chemotherapy. So for triple negative breast cancer, you must, it, it's essential to use combination therapy. So chemotherapy plus the immunotherapy. But it is, um, I mean, I, I, yeah, it would be uh, worth noting that, of course, immunotherapy is very effective against melanoma. That would be the poster child cancer. And it's effective against some lung cancers. But for breast, I think there's going to be a, a smaller role, but nevertheless significant. Charles, do you want to add to that? Andrea? Yeah, sure. I mean, for, for certain types of acute leukaemia, particularly acute lymphoblastic leukaemia, immunotherapy is becoming standard of care. And so I mentioned a couple already, the somewhat simpler antibody-based immunotherapy is very effective um, in many types of ALL and is becoming used up front, not just when the disease responds poorly or comes back. CAR T cell therapy is where um, patients own T cells, normal T lymphocytes, or those from another individual um, are engineered to recognize the leukemic cell and attack it. And there was really an explosion of interest in this when it was shown to be curative in otherwise terminal patients back in the mid 2010s. So now we're kind of you know, coming off that peak of excitement and starting to think more about who should have it, what should it look like, who's going to respond, when should we be giving the agent and all of these things are long answers but some of the things are for example the poster child if you like is B cell ALL where there's a molecule called CD19 that can be targeted and that's the most widely used. Other forms of leukemia, it's been harder. And in fact, a lot of people have thought, is, is BALL maybe the standout and the others are just going to be not as amenable to CAR-T? And that's prob the, the truth maybe is probably in the middle, but there's a lot of activity in terms of do we engineer the cells to target one or more molecules? What's the best molecule? How do we do this in acute myeloid leukemia, in T-cell leukemia? How should we engineer the CAR-T cell product? Should it be drug treatment, to, drug treated first to maximise its efficacy because they can kind of burn out over time? So, you know, th there, are, there are a number of kind of targeting questions, engineering questions, and then also, as I mentioned, timing questions. At the moment, it's pretty much given for later stage disease when it comes back or is responding less well. Well, if, should it be given up front? And in fact, if you speak to a lot of parents and say, would you rather have your child go through two and a half years of intensive multi-agent chemotherapy with long-term toxicity or have CAR T-cell therapy that could have side effects but it could be curative as a one-stop shop? You can imagine what a lot of parents would opt for. But that's, it's a really difficult issue that we're all grappling with because it's not simple and it's not non-toxic and it can have very serious side effects. 
but these are the sorts of questions that the field is starting to address, again, with this quest of not just curing the incurable, but also offering less toxic cure to those that can be treated that way. Thank you, Charles. I've got one question for Jane. Are there any new treatments for breast cancers that are non-hormone responsive? Yes, I think the, the, triple, the triple negatives, and maybe I should explain they're called triple negative because they don't express the two ovarian hormone receptors, oestrogen and progesterone, the receptors for those two, and they don't express HER2. So they're called triple negative and they're particularly difficult to target because there are no specific molecules that are targetable. And for this reason, these patients only have chemotherapy available to them. But recently, apart from immunotherapy, which is only really effective in a, in a subset of these patients, there is a molecule called trope 2 that's been identified. And they can actually link this with a, a drug um, that, that is targeted to these cells specifically. It's called a killer payload. So once it reaches these cells because they express trope 2, it kills them. And this is, I think, one of the most... These are called antibody um, drug conjugates, and it's one of the most exciting advances. Um, it's also being applied to the HER2s, but I think this is one of the first targeted therapies for triple negative breast cancer. And I should, I should add that in the case of um, uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation carriers or, or women that carry variants of these genes which inactivates them. Uh, there's a, you may have heard of PARP inhibitors. So this is also another type of targeted therapy. So they're, they're the two that are available now for uh, triple negative disease. Thank you so much, Jane. I have a, one final question to Charles and then one to all of you and then we'll hand it over to the audience. So molecular diagnostics can be used to determine whether a person is at risk uh, for a certain type of cancer. So, Charles, what are the challenges to implement molecular diagnostics more broadly? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so my bias again, but we've now made this standard of care at St Jude and when we started doing this in about 2015, people said, well, you can do it, but no one else can. And I think the challenges there were that it was expensive, it was technically challenging, you needed very sophisticated bioinformatics to analyze the data, and it was almost impossible to turn around kind of real time for it to be clinically useful. So now we've seen many of those challenges be solved. You know, the, the sequencing is faster, uh, the analysis is becoming increasingly bolted onto the machine that does the sequencing. And so that's really exciting. And so now there are the downstream challenges are more, one of them I touched on was kind of deploying it more generally, um, building up robust algorithms so that everyone gets the right result. And this is something we're very actively engaged in, remuneration and in reimbursement. And there are very few public or private insurers here or in the US or elsewhere that provide full reimbursement for genomic sequencing, so that, that's a major challenge as well. But I think the bottom line is really the technical challenges are now largely solved. It's more really an implementation science question and a cost you know, effectiveness challenge. And they're equally challenging, but equally solvable. Thank you. So one final question I have for all the panel, and I'll start with Chris, um, is, You've, you've kind of already t touched on it in um, the discussions before, but how does your research inform the new treatments and how are you currently thinking of developing new therapies? So the premise is making use of all the clinical trial data that we have gathered, the biological specimens from those. We've gathered now thousands of patients' clinical data and tens of thousands of specimens from them that are allowing us to look at the genes that are associated with the response to one therapy versus another. Interestingly enough, this luminal B feature that is associated with breast cancer, we actually see that's identifying men who are more likely to benefit from the chemotherapy approach. So it's getting all of the clinical trial data and all of the biological data into one database and being able to say, start to actually make the pie, slice up the pie like they've been doing for childhood leukemias and then be more specific as to who gets which treatment. Um, one of the projects we did called ICECAP is we've got now uh, 50,000 patients data into one database. 
And one of the challenges with doing these early studies is that it takes such a long time to see the benefits. And we're developing earlier endpoints that are surrogates for overall survival. So we can say, get the study done in eight years as opposed to uh, 15 years. And we've got two studies that have been done through that group. ANDS up again in the adjuvant setting of double hormones plus radiation versus single hormones plus radiation. And those studies will actually hopefully make further advances. And our goal will be to decrease the death rate by doing those studies and hopefully make history from a University of Adelaide base. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Jane, is there anything you want to add to that? I suppose you already have, but if there's anything else you want to elaborate on in regards to your research and where you're well, currently at now. Well, our access to, to human samples is pivotal and we're very grateful to all the donors, both reduction mammoplasties and and prophylactic mastectomy. So we, we're, we're continuing to analyse uh, tissue from um, patient, women um, in high-risk breast cancer families, and that, that's, you know, at the molecular, cellular level, and then with the ultimate goal of identifying the changes and then coming in, um, identifying a target and coming in with um, a drug. On the therapy side, we are conducting quite a few screens to look at um, drug resistance. So we're trying to identify pathways that can overcome drug resistance. But it is a long haul and um, it, it will be some time before we hopefully make it to the clinic. There. Thanks, Jane. Charles, anything else? Just to mention a couple of other things as a bit of a, a pitch, I guess. Um, so some things we do are, you know, we, we can't, no place can do everything, no one lab can do everything. And so we, believe part of our mission is generating knowledge and then disseminating that for everyone. And you may think, well, that's nothing new. Scientists publish their data. But, you know, there are ways of making it accessible that are more or less abstruse. And so we've put huge efforts into making the data, genomic data, clinical data, et cetera, as freely interrogatable and as user-friendly as possible. We have the St. Jude Cloud. And so we've built up this multi-plank, if you like, um, platform where wherever you're coming in, if you're looking at patients' genomic data, the patient cells engrafted into mice and those samples are available. Um, the primary patient samples, anyone can apply to St. Jude to access those data and, and obtain those samples. So data access is very important. There are some other pieces of the pie, I guess, for finding likely treatments that will work. I mean, we've touched on a number of these drugs already, but we routinely test all of our newly diagnosed patients for sensitivity for an increasing number of drugs. This is called pharmacotyping now to about 60 drugs. That used to be a research test and that's now becoming a clinical test so that when patients don't respond, we can say, well, actually, we found that they were responsive to drug X or drug Y and that might provide a new approach. And I mean, there's a lot more, but perhaps stop there and open for discussion. Thank you. Thank you all. So I'd now like to open it up to the floor and to our guests to ask any questions to our three panellists. Um, if you have a question, if you can just raise your hand. We've got some roaming mics that will be um, delivered to you. Don't be shy. <laughs> ask away. Ask them really tricky questions as well. Of Corinna. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I will start one, a tricky one. So given that the data and the sequence is super important in terms of the early diagnosis of the all kind of cancers, do you um, think in the future there will be um, feasible to sequence every kid when they're born and then um, cal characterize them with high risk or low risk? Then that will facilitate future like diagnosis or uh, the parent care of them, do you think that is a sort of a, um, feasible in the future? Yeah. You've started with a nice easy question, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> so we touched on this a bit earlier and the answer to the first part of your question is yes. I mean, so anyone can be sequenced now. It's becoming quite straightforward to generate, the, generate those data and you know, you'd be familiar with many of these um, companies that can offer this. The question is, what do you do with the information? And so if you sequence someone and you say, well, their risk of developing ALL or another disease is perhaps four or five-fold more than someone that doesn't have those particular genetic changes, their absolute risk is still quite low. But that information can be terribly anxiety-inducing for a lifetime. And so I think this, this is an area where there is no clear answer. 
probably the um, the most straightforward scenario is when someone's diagnosed or there's a relative that's been diagnosed and then a variant is found, a genetic change that is felt to predispose to a tumour where you have quite a clear understanding that it's highly penetrant and then that can justify screening of that individual or their family members over time. And even that can be a pretty tricky situation, requires a great deal of care and finesse to walk people through that pipeline. But I think the notion of just sequencing all children at birth and then thinking of acting on that information in every child where the risk at the moment may be relatively low, the, the imperative for that is not there yet. Thank you, Charles. Another question? I had a question and it may relate to a very small uh, number of people, but my understanding is that men can also get breast cancer. If that's the case, is, is what you've learnt in regards to women also applicable to the men? Yes, that's true. Uh, men can develop breast cancer. Um, I think in Australia, it's 30 to 40 men develop breast cancer each year. And it is of the oestrogen receptor positive um, subtype. Uh, so this is, this is a good thing. It means that it is responsive to endocrine therapy. So in the case of male breast cancer, if it's caught early, um, it is eminently treatable. Question down the front. This is a somewhat... Uh controversial question. Um, how about uh, testing uh, for in, in a prenatal genetic diagnostic um, so that you would actually obviously screen the embryo prior to its arrival? Prenatal genetic diagnosis. Who would like to tackle that one? I'll pick up <laughs> to see how it goes. So from a clinician standpoint, we, an adage that we have is you never order a test unless you know what you're going to do with the result. And Charles was alluding to that. Um, if we can say someone's high risk, low risk, well, can you do something about that high risk or not? Or you're just going to cause them an anxiety. Does knowing them high risk will allow you to identify something and start something sooner if you put a good surveillance program in? So what you're describing is there is actually a company out there called Grail because it is the Holy Grail. Um, it was a fancy name by some venture capitalists, I think, in California. But having said that, um, that's the key issue there is if we're going to develop a test, how are we going to act on it without causing way too much stress? And PSA is like a very crude example of that. We do a lot of PSA testing. A lot of men will have a PSA of 5.2 and they'll never have cancer, but they've might and they're more likely and it causes stress. So we have to learn how to manage a test we even have. Now we want to take that back to a neonatal status. It's again, we, it's incumbent of us to actually learn how to make use of that information before we carte blanche order these tests. I can perhaps give an example. So one of the studies we did, you know, um, or several of the studies we did, we found a number of these very, what we call penetrant, meaning high risk of developing leukemia variants that are present in the germline. And sometimes there is a family history and you can document that it's coming from grandma or mum or dad in, and then down into the child or it's a new germline mutation, there's been no family history. But, you know, we had to deal with this. We, we didn't know any of this information when we embarked on the study. We collected these families, which are rare. They have multiple individuals with leukaemia. They're rare, but they're very informative. And we started finding these genes. And we'd enrolled these patients on um, protocols that had very detailed consent forms. And every single patient and relative was counseled before they were tested. But then the information was returned. That was part of the protocol. And what did it mean? So we were finding one gene was Pax5, a the one that I showed on a slide, which is actually a really common mutation that's not inherited, but specific mutations are seen in an inherited context. And, but they're not absolutely penetrant. It's like not every child with the mutation we found was developing leukemia. And it's still a nominally treatable disease. And so really complex question. And of course now in the US it's become a very thorny question about the notion of what do you do with, you know, pre-birth in a fetus or an embryo about if you find one of these variants. But that's another discussion. Um, 
So, but that, you know, the, the, the knowledge has come and now we have to deal with it and it is happening. And so, you know, I can say that that information has absolutely been used where people have been given that information, people of reproductive age, and they've elected to then go on and have genetic testing done for those variants. I don't think it's been particularly common, but it's happened. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. I'm particularly interested, given the expertise and experience of the three of you sitting there, that if you were controlling the purse strings in an increasingly you know, world where healthcare expenses are blowing out and governments are trying to pick winners and pushing away from perhaps basic to science discovery into translation, if you could influence that from your experience, where would you be recommending you'd put the money if you're really going to make a quantum leap in improving cancer outcomes? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. <laughs> Who wants to go? <laughs> Jane? Um, yeah, um, there's a... There's a finite health and medical research budget, and so you can't do everything. And perhaps my comments are going to be filtered by through my own bias. So I think fundamental research is important, and it's very easy to neglect that or to treat it as something different from curing a disease. Um, it's very seductive to say we've got to fund the clinical trials and that late stage, which of course is vital, but at the expense of having a balance in the research portfolio, because if you don't understand the disease, it's very difficult to, to generate the new generation of cures. Um, there was an issue we were talking about actually earlier today, a few of us, and it might be sounding we're getting a bit off topic, but one of the biggest issues I think we have now that's related to this is the workforce. And um, it's becoming increasingly challenging to persuade our bright young people that going into these scientific areas is a fruitful endeavour compared to doing something else that might be more attractive, particularly early, early in your career from, from a remuneration perspective. So um, my, my bias, my training, what I do and where I am at the moment, um, having very rich and deep investment right across that research portfolio is crucial. But again, no one place or institution or government can do everything. And, you know, it's particularly true for Australia, which is a wonderful country, but it's, it's I guess, smaller than some other countries like the US. And you know, no one country like Australia is going to be able to devote meaningful investment effort into every single tumour type and some choices have to be made. And they're not easy choices. I think, you know, if you have to, um, you know, you can think about your perfect, you know, first 11, can't you? But you might not get all the players you want. And so you have to think about various considerations. Where do you have expertise, prostate, breast? Where do you have the right infrastructure? Where do you have the right tumour samples? Where do you have the best research networks? Where can you engage with pharma? Um, where do you have great basic scientists that are going to help you do that chemical biology or something else? So um, anyway, others, your thoughts? You go first. Well, no, it's beautifully said, Charles. I mean, I, um, I would agree that fundamental science remains very important and I believe that we need further investment in basic science in this country. And um, we also need greater linkages between the clinicians and, and basic scientists because there's, there is no point doing science in a vacuum. It's really important to identify the key questions and to work with clinicians to, to um, understand how to approach them, have access to samples, clinical samples, to work out um, the answers to a plethora of questions. So, so focus is, yeah, it is a small country, focus is going to remain really important as well. But I'll pick up on the small country, scrappy country doing really well. When you think about the average life expectancy of a person born in, in the, Australia, it's actually in the high 80s now. Men less than women, but they're still up in the mid 80s, 85, 86, 88. In the US, it's actually declining. And the, you've got to think part of that is related to a good healthcare system. So I think as much as we want to invest in research, we cannot take our foot off the pedal on good universal health care, early detection, early diagnosis, access to the right therapies. You may not have access to the therapy that may prolong a patient's life by a little bit, but it, and you're spending tens of millions of dollars of that in a country's budget, but we should be a, making sure that we're not giving up on a good health care system to be able to do great research. 
and I don't want to see patients with cancer. No. We've probably got time for um, one more question, perhaps one or two quick questions. Yep, over there. Great. Thank you. Uh, hi, thanks for your talk. I've got a bit of a naive question from the outside, but my understanding is like cancer, you need several sorts of mutations to happen and sometimes in a very specific order to avoid cell apoptosis or um, stuff like that. And it just seems improbable to me that like these mutations can get picked up along the way just based on a statistical level. Um, I guess my question is, are some cancers or progenitors of cancers um, better at evolving or are we pre-selecting them through drug treatments and stuff like that, like you mentioned, relapse that we don't quite understand yet? If my question makes sense. That, that, that's a fantastic question. Chris? Or, no, Charles, Can go I have an hour? Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's definitely seed and soil. So there are, it's very true from a lot of work in, in hematologic malignancy, for example, that there are certain progenitors, and Chris mentioned this as well, I think Jane did too in their work, that um, there are certain progenitors that are more amenable to transformation or turning from a normal cell to a tumour cell. Um, you mentioned... I guess scepticism, like there are very few mutations and it seems like it's improbable. Well, I can give you one example of what, what we understand. So for example, if you look at childhood leukemia, there is a peak of the age of two to five and, and there's been a lot of work thinking about why that's the case and people think about that's when kids go to daycare, they're exposed to infection, that sort of thing. Now with genomics, we understand a lot more about why that happens and for example, um, what happens when kids are going through that age, they're going through a massive expansion of maturation of their normal immune response where those lymphocytes are now diversifying their ability to recognise all sorts of different bugs and pathogens and that sort of thing. And that same machinery that allows that maturation of that immune response is aberrantly knocking off genes that then can promote leukaemia formation. So... Yes, there's a bit of bad luck, if you like, that it happens in some kids and not others, but it's a very active process that goes on in all of us. And in fact, if you look at this room, I can guarantee you that some of you have got leukemia fusion proteins, but you don't have leukemia. But some of you, well, hopefully not some of you, but some people then go on and, and develop the additional genetic changes that can cause development of a fully fledged leukemia. Uh, your second part was relapse. And Again, there's a lot of work that's been done in all tumours, really, um, understanding what goes on from initial diagnosis through treatment and then evolution through relapse. And a lot of that is genetic mutation as well. There are some, most patients with leukaemia, when they come through at diagnosis, have not one tumour but many, with some but not complete sharing of genetic makeup of their tumour subpopulations. And often it's the biggest clone at diagnosis that's extinguished, but it's the more dormant clones that can win through. And they may already have drug resistance mutations, or they then go on and pick up additional mutations. And some of those are actually caused by treatment. So again, speaks to that notion that trying to pick the best treatment and give it earlier to avoid that process is, is imperative. I'll just finish on a bit of a more positive note. Yes, we all have those <laughs> mutations and we're all at risk and we may be carrying the leukemia fusion mutations. I'm not gonna be thinking about that over dinner, but, what we can do is focus on a healthy lifestyle. We all are at risk, the environment and everything around us, but healthy diet, no smoking, minimising alcohol, getting your BMI down, exercising. They're all things we can do to decrease the risk that one of those genetic mutations will occur or you will not get the next one. And that's why some people that healthy fit are less likely to get cancer because they're having less insults to cause those mutations. I'm trying to finish on a positive note. Yeah. Thanks for walking me back, Chris. That was important. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, are there any, any? Oh, there's, oh, there's someone, a hand at the back. There's one oh, there's here. one here. Sorry. Okay, the last two, and then I think we'll we'll close it. Hello. Um, I'm just questioning um, if you're open to energy medicine, energy healing, and the body, not just the physical body, but the body, mind, and soul. I picked that one up because I've got a bit more of the Power touchy of feeling thoughts. of plates. <laughs> um, so I actually do think there is something to what is known as neuroimmunology, neuropharmacology, whereby stress situations are sending out possibly cancer-promoting toxins. There's actually interesting data around that. If, for example, the incidence of patients who had cancer after the in Sweden 
of those who were associated with the tsunami in Thailand just went up, skyrocketed in the families and the people of the survivors. And there's just some really bizarre findings around acute stress causing being associated with cancer. What the cause is is unknown. So it would speak to that there is something to actually being in a calm state and not being somehow the body being prone to maybe causing immunosuppression and putting you at risk of a cancer. So there's something there, I think, but we've got a lot of work to work out what that something is. Is that a bit too touchy-feely? I, I had myodysplasia as a teenager, pre-malignant bone cancer, and my mum here being a nurse, she actually said no to a well, my brother wasn't compatible to be a bone marrow transplant donor and I went down the natural path and I learned back then with the stress, I was doing um, nursing at university here at Underdale and I, mum just said, you're quitting everything, went stress-free, went on molasses and different things and, yeah, I didn't require anything. So my journey is, you know, different to other people but I didn't require any drugs or anything. So quite powerful. Um, I'm sure that you guys have anticipated this question but... Um, what are your thoughts on using AI to help um, with early detection and, um, I guess, more personalised treatments for patients who do get diagnosed either at an early stage or at a later stage? I think I mentioned um, mammographic screening before because this is a very complex area and they're using machine learning to... Um, to derive computer programs that can predict uh, one's risk of potential risk of developing breast cancer. But this is all in the very, very um, early days. So we, we'll have to see, you know, how far it goes. Um, but I mean, I think there is um, a lot of potential work to be done in that space. Uh, and we'll know the benefit with time. I'll just follow up and say, it's a matter of us getting all the good data that we've been talking about, the imaging data from a mammogram, for example, the PSMA PET skin imaging data, the, the bio, uh, circulating blood cells that Charles was referring to, this cl clonal hematopoiesis, getting that all in the data into a database, really good quality data, paired with the clinical outcomes, and then just having the machine learning be able to do it. So yes, machine learning is here. It's our job to get the good data in so we can get good data out. Okay, in the interest of time, I think there was a lady here that had hand up and then there is an arm that has been up in the air for quite a long time over in that aisle over there. So if we could just finish off with those last two questions, that would be fantastic. Yeah. So this one's for Charles uh, and it's about your piece of work on the contemporary genomic diagnostics globally. So given the genome reference resources and our sort of knowledge of genomics really we know that it doesn't necessarily capture our global diversity, especially in terms of ancestry. So do you think that it's actually possible for all children globally right now to have equitable benefit from genomic diagnostics? And sort of, if not, do you think that's a challenge that you'll have to sort of grapple with with that piece of work? Yeah, this is a fantastic question. I'll try and be brief. So I think the we think about this a lot and there are two parts of the approach and one is you know building on that notion that 90 percent of the genomic research has been done a, basically in a you know white northern european or similar population from the work we have done in you know we've gone into other um, ancestral populations we know there are very important ancestral differences um, in terms of the actual subtypes of leukaemia we see, we don't see that many surprises. Their prevalence may differ. However, the approach that we're taking is we can't do everything all at once. You know, we have 200 partner sites plus, but we, we're starting in a proof of principle approach where, for example, we're trying to tackle more upper middle income countries that might have some sequencing infrastructure. We've got a sub-Saharan Africa where they've got nothing and some others. And But again, we're trying to... It's teach a man to fish, teach a person to fish and build capability, but also perform that scientific question as well. So you know, how much do we not know about the, the basis of disease in those areas? Can it be done? I think absolutely. You know, so the, the different sequencing platforms differ in their complexity still, but some are you know, like USB dongles now. They're, they're very straightforward. They're not as high resolution as some of those state-of-the-art, but they're pretty good. And those algorithms to do the analysis on the fly, either locally or in the cloud, are there. Um, so a lot of those pieces are there. And again, this is really 
not so much a new scientific project question, it's more an implementation science question. I think it's eminently uh, feasible. Um, I've done lots of research about cancer over the past few years, and I looked at some older videos of this scientist who created um, a telescope um, a microscope to zoom in on the different type of bacteria that were causing cancers in, in multiple different cells. But he created this machine which has frequencies and has two forked like tongues at the end. And once certain to frequency can destroy that bacteria or that bad cell from creating cancer. Is it possible we can use this device in the future or is it um, being used currently? I'm not aware of it being used. Uh, what I would say though is there is evidence that some infections are associated with cancer, so there is an observation that would make sense. How we treat those infections is varied. Um, so I would say, I don't know about the treatment that he described, but the observation is probably real. Um, I'm not aware of any microscopes treating any cancers in 2023. No, but maybe we will find one and make history at Uni Adelaide. <laughs> well, um, I think on behalf of every all the attendees here, I would like to thank all three of our panellists for enlightening us on the amazing work that they're doing in, in making cancer history. So can you please all join with me in, in thanking Jane, Chris and Charles um, for their... <laughs>I'd just like to close by thanking you all so much for coming out on this beautiful evening to the University of Adelaide and I hope you've gained a greater insight into the fabulous work that our alumni do here from the University of Adelaide and I wish you all a wonderful rest of your weekend. Well, weekend, not quite. Evening. <laughs> Thanks.